DCT Audio, the art of good listening. You're listening to a podcast on the Audio Boom Network. This is a mindful life with me, Dave Thomas. Thank you for downloading this edition of the program. I do hope you enjoy it. My name's Rhys Rutledge, former soldier, most recently served 13 and a half years, Infantry Regiment, 1st Battalion, Welsh Guards. Prior to joining the Army, I also found myself on the wrong side of the law, involved with addiction, crime and drugs, and ended up behind the door. Rhys, if uh, we'd been doing this interview several years ago, I would have started by saying this interview has been recorded and maybe used as evidence if this matter goes to court and you would have given me a no-comment interview. Thankfully, we are in very different times today and I'm hoping it will be a full and frank account. Now, the Buddhists say always go back to the root. So with that in mind, can you share a little bit about your childhood? Yeah, so growing up from uh, quite a young age, life was slightly different for myself and especially for my siblings as well as my mother. We were exposed to quite sort of a violent upbringing. I'm very sort of abusive, especially from my father. And most of that was fueled through alcohol. So being at that young age, I witnessed a lot. There was a lot of grievance between my brother and my father. Now, that brought and opened up a whole new vision on life. You know, it almost became normal. But in my mother's defense, you know, she'd done absolutely everything possible and gave us the best childhood growing up. Again, referring back to my father, you know, fueled on alcohol, um, and that would lead to uh, disruption in the family home life. It was very sort of difficult. He would work, um, and as the time approached, 1700 was his normal sort of finish time. But prior to coming home, he would always ensure that he would hit the pub and get absolutely upside down. And that was a, um, you know, a daily sort of routine. He would come home. And as that time approached, we would have an amazing day, you know, really, really sort of a happy family day-to-day activity. But then, you know, in the back of your mind, you'd always be thinking, right, my dad's going to be home soon. You'd be treading on eggshells, knowing what was about to happen. So normal routine, mum would have uh, tea on the table for 1700, ready for him to come home and ready for us all to sit down. So we'd always sit at the table and he'd walk past the uh, back window and that was the way that he'd walk into the house. And you just knew the second he'd walk through that door that all hell let loose was going to, you know, explode. Um, He would have it in for my brother um, to the point that them two would become very sort of violent towards one another. He would be very physically abusive towards him. And, um, you know, in in his defence, he would stand up for himself. I think a lot of it stemmed with jealousy. So my father was quite a a shortish guy. He was only five foot seven, five foot eight. And my brother being quite a big lad, quite stocky, he felt intimidated by my brother and he felt that he had a point to prove. Myself, my mum would be stuck in, in the middle of it. Them two would literally be brawling, fighting, knocking seven kinds of shit out of each other. The table would be flipped up. And, you know, as a young lad, having to witness that. But that was just a normal, regular occurrence. You know, it became not perfectly normal. We didn't really see anything wrong with it. That was that was routine. So this went on for many, many years and I do honestly believe that this this has definitely got a lot to play with how things panned out for myself, um, you know, in the near future. So how old would you have been when this domestic violence was going on within the home? I'd only be the sort of age between 14, uh, 15, so quite quite a youngish age, old enough to understand that, you know, this, this isn't right, what I'm witnessing, but yet it would never go any further than the four walls in the house. It would always be kept quiet. And I suppose 14, 15 years old is a difficult time growing up for, for any lad, but to, to have that pressure in, in there. Well, it's a pressure cooker, isn't it? Absolutely. And as I said to you, you know, my mum found herself doing a dual role. She was, you know, caring for us, providing for us and giving us absolutely everything, trying to give us the best start possible. But then when you've got someone that's fueled up on alcohol, 
who becomes so aggressive, what are you meant to do? My mother would be protecting myself, my brothers, but then it's a tricky one for her because obviously it's, you know, it's it's a rather half, but yeah, he was so abusive and violent towards, um, towards my brother. It sounds an obvious question, but how did that affect you personally? It made me very cautious. I had to become very mature for my age. I had to become quite streetwise. If anything, I was a lot more older in mind than what I was at that current time. It's interesting because you would have thought that seeing the misery and the upset that this caused within the home, that it would make me go the opposite way. But, you know, we'll expose more of that as we go on and, and how I chose the path I did. Okay, now, I suppose the reason I asked you about your childhood, race is because, you, you know, you never set out to become an addict and a, and a dealer. Nobody does. So looking back at what happened, what do you think was the catalyst to make you choose that road that you ultimately found yourself on? I think, you know, again, referring to the age that I was at that current time, my mother would be out working predominantly most of the day, same as my father. So me and my siblings, we would be left to an extent to, to do what we wanted to do. So with one of my siblings who's five years older than myself, he had found himself in a situation where he was dealing with drugs and the, the drugs was introduced within to the household. Um, and obviously what comes along with that are the people that you associate and affiliate with. Again, at that moment in time, I was very anti against it all. You know, I would constantly be questioning why are you getting yourself involved with that. But then as time evolved, one of the, the sort of dealers that my sibling was affiliated with, he had a younger brother who was a little bit older than myself. He found himself getting involved in it. So what in actual fact is happening here is a, um, a repeat cycle of the process, generation being passed down to generation. And before you knew it, I found myself in a situation that something I never thought or wanted to do, I'm now finding myself dealing, selling drugs, associating with like-minded people. I always reflect back and think, how could I have done that to myself after I've seen what this is causing within that network, the family network? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not a glamorous life, I would suspect. Uh, it's a life full of paranoia and fear, both for yourself and, and for the other people that you, you, you're dealing to, I suppose. There's nothing good to be said about it, but yet you still went ahead and uh, embraced that lifestyle. Exactly. And I think you've just touched on it, that there is nothing glorious or um, special about that lifestyle. But I think you're trying to find your feet in the world. You know, you're at that young age, you, you, you want to create your own path. And I think a lot of it stems down to you want to be something in life like anybody else, whether you choose the right path or the wrong path. Unfortunately for myself, it was the wrong path I chose. But at that current moment in time, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't care because I was setting out in life to become something. And, you know, dealing with drugs... And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, I actually enjoyed that lifestyle for a period of time. You know, I enjoyed the sort of publicity it bought, the money, the independence I had. It, it felt like you were a part of something, you, you were a network, you were respected. When I look back now, if you're in a job and you work hard, you get rewarded for it. So it was no different. Unfortunately, it was just the legal activities that I was conducting and uh, dealing in. That's really interesting you say that because, and I think this is where you and I have something in common perhaps, is that what you've told me, it sounds like you were looking for recognition. And I had some counselling when I had a, a breakdown in, in my job and uh, the counsellor said, well, why, why did you join the police? I said, well, because I wanted to help people. And she said, no, 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 why did you really want to join the police? And it was recognition in the end of the day. She nailed it. And it's because I had an unhappy childhood, not as bad as yours, admittedly, but I too was looking for recognition. I think I think there's some common ground there. Absolutely agree. And I think I knew from a young age that I was sort of different from your average 15, 16 year old. I knew I had a, a lot more to offer and I just knew it deep down inside that I could pursue this and uh, really expose myself and, and again, trying to create a stance and, and, and become something. The lifestyle that you live, you don't 
think twice about the risk that it brings. You don't give a shit about the misery it causes. You become very selfish. In actual fact, you've got your blinkers on. You can't look left. You can't look right. You're so fixated on looking one way and that's forward. You know, you lose a lot of good friends, family. You lose trust. You lose You lose all that respect. The deeper and more involved I got with it, this is when I realized that I couldn't just give up you know, I've, I've really dug myself quite a hole here and I know that I'm um, digging that hole even deeper. What you describe are, are classic signs and lifestyles of an addict really, aren't they? Uh, whatever you're addicted to, whether it be drugs, alcohol, I know people are addicted to work, it's the same thing. Yeah, you know, addiction, it comes in all shapes and sizes and for quite some time I didn't consume or take drugs. I was all about having that clean slate, you know, building the reputation. I think my biggest sort of downfall from this business, because that's essentially what it is. Again, it's just a, a business, but it, it carries an illegal title to it. It was high demanding. It was busy. You know, it's not your average nine to five job. The phones are constantly going. An addict will always want a drug, regardless of what time of day it is. So I became very sort of fatigued. I'm trying to meet these demands, ensuring that I'm supplying the drug that the addict requires. And it wasn't until a good sort of year into it, somebody introduced me to cocaine. At first, I declined the offer. I said, no, not interested. And as time evolved again, that same person said, you know, look, have you considered selling the white, you know, a bit of cocaine? You can double your profits, triple your profits. And not only that, why don't you take a little bit yourself, you know, and, and see what all the fuss is about. So at this point, he caught me off guard. I was quite vulnerable at that point because, you know, I was trying to meet these demands. You're ducking and diving the police. You you know, you're trying to keep your head above the parapet. And that's when I would f first took my, my uh, well, took the cocaine. It took a good eight months for me to then fully understand that I am now an addict to the point I'm consuming that much cocaine, whether it be snorting it, smoking it, any way means possible that's i would consume that cocaine i realized that i had an addiction and this wasn't just a normal addiction this was an addiction that had taken over my life completely to the point i'm taking cocaine on my own so i can't even say it was a uh, recreational sociable drug you were doing it just to socialize i was doing it i couldn't even go and supply the next drug to the next person that was waiting with at least stopping two to three times in a car, pulling over, taking a few lines of cocaine, and then continuing on, dropping the product off. And this was a pattern that would go on literally 24-7 around the clock. And to become more deviant with it, I would smoke it so I could consume as much cocaine as possible now without having to stop the vehicle and continue to the next person that was waiting for that drug and smoke it whilst driving. I, I just think to myself, you know, what have I got myself into? But not only that, I'm now in debt. So I've gone from earning profit to using the profit now to, to purchasing and feeding and fueling that addiction myself. It's that classic cycle, isn't it, of any addiction, you know, you, you take a substance to, to get the hit, to get the dopamine hit, to feel good, but then afterwards, the, the, the stage after, you come down, you've got the shame, and then ultimately you end up taking the drug just to counter effect its negative aspects and you forget the reason why you took it in the first place, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a very, you know, it is a vicious cycle and I could be up for two to three days at a time, absolutely high off the cocaine, not eating, not washing. So my hygiene had gone downhill, my appearance. You know, I, I looked absolutely terrible. And I always remember looking in the mirror at myself and this stranger that I'd seen in the mirror was no longer me anymore. I'd lost all reality with Reese. This, this, this was somebody else I was looking at in the mirror. My skin was clammy. I was constantly sweating, I was anxious, I was paranoid. Sometimes I couldn't even leave the house to go and sell the product because I was just that paranoid off the cocaine and, and you know, the damage it was causing me. Well, I certainly know from a police point of view, you know, operationally, we'd, we'd know who the dealers were and who the associates were, where they frequented, who they frequented with. And if we were to see a drug dealer in the street, you would be stopped and you would be spoken to. So obviously your former life did bring you into contact with law enforcement. 
you know, it was only a matter of time because of my complacency. I'd gone from being a quite a savvy uh, streetwise sort of kid to now being a full-blown addict. I'm also fighting my own demons. I'm dealing with this drug addiction. And to be perfectly honest with you, I got quite sloppy, got complacent, and I wasn't covering my tracks as best as what I should be. So it was only a matter of time before I fell into the trap and I was introduced to the police. And let's be honest, the police aren't stupid. They're always one step ahead of you. They know your activities. They're just waiting for that right time to make it worth their while to catch you with a substantial amount of drugs because it's not worth catching you with personal use because all you're going to get is literally turf back out and continue doing what you're doing. So that, again, the police had invested that time to find, you know, with you carrying a substantial amount of drugs. We'd already had a name with the police so we were quite sort of well known to the police again with it being quite a small area everyone was inside each other's pockets and you know news travels quickly and I'll never forget this day for as long as I live I'd had somebody in the vehicle with me at this time I'd just picked up a kilo of drugs luckily for me it was only a class c resin at that time so it's actually the lowest class of drug that you could you know have in your possession um carried a obviously a lot less punishment than uh, other drugs that i'd had go through my hands the person that was in the vehicle with me was a crack addict he was literally you know tooting on a pipe as we were driving along and as uh, we continued in the vehicle in front of me was a road police block i had two options here bearing in mind knowing what i was carrying in the vehicle i didn't know what the occupant in the vehicle was carrying on his personal possession two options i either continue towards the police block or i turn the vehicle around give chase and hopefully you know evade capture and live to fight another day and to my amazement what i did actually decide to do I casually drove towards the police barricade, the police stop block, and uh, I pulled over casually, and I was rifted out the car, right? Absolutely rifted out the car. They knew exactly who I was. The car had been flagged. Uh, I was placed onto the ground. I wasn't actually handcuffed. I was actually zip-tied, and uh, sniffer dogs were on the scene at that very moment, and the dogs went through my vehicle. The person in question that was with me at the time, he was obviously uh, searched as well. And uh, within five minutes, approximately, the drugs were found in the vehicle. For that split second, I felt good. I felt absolutely like I was back to Reese again. I felt human. And why, you may ask, because the weight had been lifted off my shoulders for that split second. Everything had come to an end. I wanted this lifestyle to, to end. That that was, you know, the call. And I thought, that is it. We are done. And then, bang, reality hits you hard, square in the face. You've just been caught carrying a kilo of drugs. Now, let's bear in mind, I already owe a substantial amount of money. This kilo I've just been caught with is adding to the money that I already owe to the, to the sort of bigger dealers. And I just thought, there's no answer for this. So immediately, obviously arrested and uh, taken to the station and then, um, you know, conducted for interview. The car was seized, the drugs were seized. Now, at that moment in time, my fixed address was my mother's address that I was living at. And, you know, lo and behold, there was already a warrant to go back and search that property. And I'll never forget, you're allowed one telephone call when you arrive at the custody and uh, I declined and rejected to uh, make that call. Again, because I knew what was back at the property. I knew there was paraphernalia. I knew there was scales. I knew there was money. I knew there was debt lists and so on and so on. Enough, um, again, you know, to arrest me on the grounds of uh, possession with intent supply. Eventually, um, as I said to you, I was arrested, detained, uh, questioned, and then eventually released upon bail. You know, further inquiries would be investigated into building up that bigger case for the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, to ensure that they can uh, have a good, strong case against me. No comment interview, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Absolutely. No comment throughout. Ultimately, you did go to jail, didn't you? This was quite a, quite a roller coaster because I'd just been caught with the drugs that I was carrying in my possession. I'm in a predicament, I'm in a situation now where I can't just down tools and call it a day and that's it and be done with it. The dealers still want their money, regardless 
no fucks are given, they still want paying. And they will go to any means possible to ensure that they get their money. The time that I'm on bail is the time that I'm now getting myself more involved, more in debt, trying to get myself out of that hole I've dug for myself to sell more product. My addiction's gone through the roof. I'm feeding my addiction even more so than ever. I also carry the extra pressure of if I'm caught whilst on bail doing what I've already previously been arrested for, that's just going to go against me. So the risk is absolutely heightened tenfold. Again, my mother, the, the, the person that stood by my side through the good times and through the bad times, regardless, it's unconditional love. She's been there right from day one. Took me to go and answer to bail. And I'll never forget, I said to my mum, I said, look, I'll only be five minutes, go in, find out what I'm going to get charged with, back in the car and off we go. No. I got there, I was let into the custody suite, and two police officers stood on either side of me. I was re-arrested on selling a Class A, conspiracy to sell Class A, which was acid and LSD at the time. So I'd gone to answer to bail, thinking I was going to get a, a slap on the wrist or a charge for the possession with intent to supply, and then I'd be released the same day so I can carry on selling more drugs. No, to my amazement, there I was, arrested, and gone through the whole procedure again. And I said to the police, I said, look, common courtesy, could you please just go and let my mother know she's actually sat outside in the car waiting for me to come back out. Can you please just let her know what's happened? As I know, the conspiracy offences, they, they carry a really heavy jail sentence. I can't even think straight. I, I'm sat in a cell, pacing backwards and forwards. I haven't got any more answers. I, I do not know what else to think, say. And all that was going through my mind was when they'd arrested me that first time round, I knew that all the paraphernalia and everything was left in, in my possession within the property. And what they'd actually arrested me on the grounds of, for the uh, conspiracy, for the acid, were all the working outs, how much profit I would make. That's how complacent I became. I, I'd actually worked it down to the last pound, what profits I would make. So there it was, black and white. And they had the grounds to arrest me on that. How many times did you uh, spend in jail? How many sentences did you serve? I've only ever had one custodial sentence. Prior to that point, I've been arrested the very first time when I was caught with the uh, drugs in the vehicle. That was actually the first contact I'd ever had with the police. So I managed to keep quite unscathed um, and I kept quite a clean track record. But then what I realised was I was on the uh, on the radar then you know, they, they, they were watching me very closely. One thing that, again, stands out to me, the time that I was on bail, and then obviously once I'd gone through that procedure of being re-arrested on the uh, conspiracy to sell the Class A, because that's what acid was at that time, was a Class A drug, that I'm back with my whole life is on hold now, because even if I wanted to go legit and work a legitimate job, I couldn't, because who on earth is going to take somebody on with all these charges hanging over their head. Not only that, the money that I now owe him, we're talking close to £15,000. What other choice have I got but to continue doing what I'm doing? Not only am I feeding my addiction and killing myself, I'm destroying my family, and I'm just like a rabbit in the headlights, you know, and I'm absolutely stuck. I'm crying out for help. I'm depressed. I just, I just do not know what to do anymore. The thought of jail scares the life out of me, I'll be honest. Just take yourself back. Can you describe that, those first few hours? It's a whole different way of life inside. Yeah, and I think what made it even more daunting for myself was I was going into an environment, the unknown, knowing that I owed a substantial amount of money. And the reason I highlight that is because the dealers had people working on the inside in the prisons, inmates conducting illegal activities i knew i had to have my wits about me so it wasn't just like your average person going inside doing his time come out and, and you know continue it was difficult because i had this addiction i was going into prison with an addiction again i didn't highlight that to any of the uh the prison staff i kept my cards quite close to my chest I was very reluctant to come out myself for the first duration of the time. It was a 23-hour bang-up, so you were banged up for 23 hours of the day. 
you'd have a 45 minute association which would allow you to go downstairs and play pool associate with uh, other people collect your mail and then it was back to your room again now if i'm perfectly honest with you i very very rarely left that cell so in actual fact i was doing 24 hours on lockdown because i was just so scared so paranoid anxious there was some horrible people in there in my mind were gunning for me to, to make it clear that we know who you are you owe the money make sure that money gets paid and you know so i was i was living in fear perhaps it was horrific well um you know you describe virtually solitary confinement aside from the effects that will have on your mental health you did say that you were an addict going into jail you didn't mention that to the staff. How how did you deal with the physical effects of not being able to take drugs or, or did you take drugs in prison? Let's be under no illusion. Drugs are freely available within the prison system. It's all about who you know. Prison is a haven for people like myself and obviously dealing does take place within the prisons and they do pray and do take advantage on people like myself knowing that we are addicts. So I thought if I exposed that I'm an addict, I'm just going to get myself into more of a situation. So I had to basically cold turkey and, you know, try and wean myself off the temptation of even wanting to take these drugs within the prison. And again, I think that that will um, reflect on why I spent so much time behind that door, just to make sure that, you know, I, I, I wasn't tempted to fall into that cycle again. Now, we've talked about hitting rock bottom, haven't we? And sometimes I think people think they're at the bottom and in reality, they're, they're nowhere near. Uh, what was your rock bottom moment? I didn't want to live anymore. I just didn't give a flying fuck about life. I no longer wanted to live. And if I, again, if I'm honest with you, I contemplated suicide um, on a couple of occasions and I really thought the process through and I, and I thought if I take my life... It's the easiest way out. Yes, it's the coward's way out. But the reason that I would have considered it and followed it through would to be to give my family that peace and, you know, life that they deserve because it's not fair that I dragged them through all that shit because of my own doing. So again, I, I mean, I, I'm in an absolute mess with drugs. I've got no one to turn to. I've exhausted every possible avenue of even scoring any more drugs because the dealers now were fully aware of what I got myself in, into. I was being supplied drugs from one person, using those drugs to try and sell to then pay off the other drug dealer. And it just became a vicious cycle. And, you know, there were five different, five to six different people that I was doing this to. So the, the main rock bottom for myself was I remember my mum walking into my room and I was literally on all, on all fours, on hands and knees, absolutely crying my eyes out just having an absolute nervous breakdown i can't even begin to explain to you what i was feeling at that moment in time and i said to her i said mum look i'm in one fucking hell of a mess here I, I i just don't know what to do anymore and the hardest words for me to hear was my mum turn around stand over me and say reese i no longer know what to do for you anymore now imagine how difficult that must be for a parent to have to say that to their own child. Not because she didn't love me or care for me. It's just she had no solution. She had no answer. And my last words to my mum were, I promise mum, I will make you fucking proud of me one day. I promise you. Those words from your mum, I guess, are a mother's wisdom, isn't it? It's the hard reality is the fact that no one's coming to rescue you. No. Only you can change yourself. So what stopped you from taking your own life? If I'm perfectly honest again, I think, you know, had my mum not walked in at the time she did walk in to find me in that state, I think had I been given another five, ten minutes, then I wouldn't be here having this interview. And yeah, I think things would have been a lot different. Well, we have a lot to thank your mother for, haven't we? Now, obviously, you went on to join the army. But tell me about that process. Why the army? Going back to our sort of previous conversation there and my words that I said to my mother, you know, I promise one day to make you proud of me. It's actually quite ironic because in the same sentence, I looked up at her and I said, look, I need somebody to tell me what to do. I need structure. I need routine. 
I physically need somebody to pick me up and walk me to point A, point B, because I can't obviously do it. And you didn't have that? No. Uh, And as a child, did you? No, no, absolutely not. So I looked up at her and I said, look, mum, take me to the recruiting office. Her eyes rolled in the back of her head because she'd heard that much shit come out of my mouth throughout the time. And she just thought, here we go again. This is one of Reese's uh, wild fantasies. And I said, no, mum, I'm being perfectly honest. Take me to the recruiting office. So she looked at me and she said, you know, we've got nothing to lose. Come on, get in the car. Let's go. Now, this was a time that the recruiting process was slightly different and it wasn't done online. You know, you physically had to go into a recruiting office and speak to a real life soldier. And <laughs> you were going to promise to show you the world. <laughs> exactly. Well, this, is, this, this, this brings me on to the next bit and it's actually very funny. So anyway, we jumped in the car. I've got no knowledge of the military whatsoever. Nobody in my family has ever served in the military. So nobody could even sit me down and give me a good old pet talk and say, this is what this is, etc. So we jumped in the car and we went to Rill. We pulled up outside the recruiting office and my mum said, are you sure you want to go through with this? I said, yeah, let's let's just get on with it. We go in there and the first thing I seen was this guy stood in uniform, slightly overweight. He looked at me. I'm probably weighing about seven stone wet through at this moment in time. And he looks at me and he says, uh, what can I do for you, but Thick Welsh accent. I said, I want to join the army. <laughs> And I said, look, I need to get away from this place. I don't care where you send me. I just need to join the army. And he looked at me and he said, he goes, do you know what? Have you ever contemplated flying a helicopter? Now, let's bear in mind, 40 minutes ago, I was at the lowest point in my life. And I'm stood there now in front of this soldier that's saying, have you ever thought about flying a helicopter? I'm hanging on to every word he is telling me. And I am like a nodding dog. I love what he's telling me. And he goes, even better, have you ever driven a tank? I'm like, Jesus, this, this is phenomenal. My, my, everything's getting answered. And do you know what? 13 plus years I've served in the military. Not once have I ever driven a tank, flown a helicopter, and I thought, <laughs> you lying bastard. But he saved my life, and I've got a lot to thank him for that. So his recruiting mindset come into play, and he sold me. Yeah, he's done an amazing job. And I was like saying, you're going to be sailing yachts off the beaches of Antigua. Well, he may as well have said that. He said everything else. You know, it was like he had his little notebook there, all the bullet points he needed to hit, he hit, and he very, you know, he succeeded very well. And one thing that's quite ironic, you're given three choices as well in the recruiting office. And again, as I said, see, I, I knew nothing about the army. Um, I was quite sort of naive to it, to be perfectly honest. And you're given three choices. And I said to him, I said, what are these three choices? He said, well, choose three different regiments or, or different parts of the army that you'd be interested in. And the only regiment that I had an inkling about or knew anything of were, were the paras. So I wrote one para, two para, three para. And guess what? Never ended up there. Ended up the fucking Welsh Guards tonight. <laughs> Well, it's it's a regiment with a strong history behind it. There's there's no uh, there's no shame whatsoever in being a guardsman. No, no, and uh, um, you know, and I think going through the whole process. So, one thing I would just like to uh, sort of make clear from the time that you released, i.e., from uh, custody, there is actually a two year call off period from when you can make that first application to join the army. Well, I was going to ask you that. Obviously, you're past played a part yeah you had well, had to have disclosed that to the army yes yes absolutely and um you know that was made very crystal clear right from day one that partially one of my reasons well if not the full reason for wanting to join the army i needed a new life and i wanted a fresh start and i'd explained that i'd been through this whole process you know of being convicted for possession and sense supply received a custodial sentence and again that's what the policy was at that time, it was a two-year two year cool-off period um, before you could make that first application. So there was a bit of a, a gap where I had to ensure that my licenses were all done, the probation was all done, um, you know, and everything was put to bed before I could uh, get my foot in the door, so to speak. Well, that must have been a difficult time for you, that those two years before you were able to sign the dotted line and, and start your training. How did you cope with that? Because I'm sure it must have been very easy just to slide back into the old life that you had. I'd um, found myself in a situation where it was 
you know, the debt that I still owed was still there. I hadn't really reduced that debt. But what I had started doing was not selling drugs, slowly started getting myself back on the straight and narrow. But then I, I was just so paranoid, um, you know, the taunts, the threats, the dealers would come around to my parents' house, scare the living hell out of my uh, out of my mum, you know, taunting, trying to get the money out of her. Because at the end of the day, if they can't get the money out of you, they're going to go to the next best thing and that'll be your family. Of course they will. You know, these people aren't stupid. So it was a bit of a, a sticky wicket and, and no man's land, essentially, to find yourself in. My family were trying to keep me as sort of occupied as possible to fulfill and, and, and fill that gap to ensure that I didn't go back into that cycle again. I asked you a few moments ago about your rock bottom moment. I know you've been overseas, you've served in Afghanistan, which again is, you know, affects a lot of people, that of itself. One thing that I took full advantage of when joining the army was I'd already had a previous life prior to joining the army. And what I mean by that, I was quite savvy, quite streetwise, hell of a lot more maturer than I was at my age. And I'd been quite exposed to the world before joining the army. I knew I was different from such a young age. I knew I had so much to offer and so much to give. So I'd found the army it was like, it, it was natural to me. What I did discover was how quickly I got myself promoted um, and became very successful within the army. You know, I'd uh, gone through training in 2009, arrived in battalion at 2010. 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan, Herrick 16. Immediately after that, upon return, I found myself on my first promotional course. Now, you don't get given promotion, you have to earn promotion you your your peers and your senior ncos have to see the potential in you to put your name forward so i already knew that i was advancing forward within my career i successfully passed my first promotional course in 2013 i was then on my second promotional course which was in brecon that was in 2014 so at this point now i've passed two promotional courses and i'm now a land sergeant so essentially, I'm a section commander. I'm in charge of a body of men. So I always reflect back. You've gone from being the lowest point in your life to wanting to take your own life to now being given a responsibility to ensure that you look after guys that work under your command. My next promotional course was a massive step up the ladder, and that was to become a platoon sergeant that is to look after 28 soldiers, again, all under your command. And there were NCOs as well, so non-commissioned officers that I had the responsibility, uh, the duty of care for those soldiers. And I was looking after, as I said, 28 soldiers. So you've gone fighting to survive yourself, looking after and trying to survive day by day to now being given a responsibility to looking after 28 soldiers, which is quite remarkable. We've done multiple overseas exercises, done three operational tours, been around a bit i'm curious as to whether your previous life experience you were able to bring that into your role as a sergeant yeah i think within the regiment i had the upper hand and the advantage so when young soldiers joined okay i was very conscious and knowing that they come from deprived areas possibly very similar backgrounds to myself so i would knew and know how to treat these individuals and I would often would like to think that my junior soldiers had a lot of respect and, it, you know, I had mutual respect for them as well. So I knew how to deal with these sort of cases again because I had that previous lifestyle. So nothing ever phased me. I was quite a calm, collective, approachable, open door policy soldier. Calm under fire, as they say. Absolutely. Yeah. The pinnacle, I think, of your army career. And I suppose the dream of every guardsman was trooping the colour for the Queen's birthday. But not only were you there, you played a very special part in that, didn't you? Yes. So whilst deployed in Belize, um, that was in 2020, the regimental sergeant major and the commanding officer had come out to visit us. I believe it was for the last two weeks, possibly 10 days. So they, they'd come out. Um, to see us conducting our final exercise, you know, to make sure that they were happy and obviously come and see the guys as well. And I was sort of pulled to one side by the commanding officer. I was asked 
or should I say told, you are going to be uh, the escorts of the colour, for the Troop of the Colour, for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Just before you go on, people that don't know what the colours are, uh, can you just describe what that is and just how important it is to the regiment? So the Troop of the Colour is a, it's a flag that holds all our battle honours. So ever since the regiment was formed, Welsh Guards being back in 1915, every conflict across the world that the regiment have ever participated or been had involvement with, the battle would go onto the colour. That's what it's called. And that, that was known as um, a battle honour. The colour at all times must be escorted. An armed escort must constantly... Keep observation on the colour. The colour can never be left unattended. Um, it's it, and again, that's that's what it means. The colour has to be escorted, and it was shown out of honour, respect for the trooping of the colour. This trooping of the colour was history in the making. Slightly different from any other trooping of the colour, because we had COVID to battle with. Now it was all up in arms whether the troop in the colour was actually going to go ahead. We were told, I believe it was either four or five weeks prior to the troop in the colour taking place, we've been given the thumbs up and yes, it will be held. However, this was not to be held on Horse Guards Parade Square, as tradition has had it. It was going to be held at Windsor Castle. So this was very unique in its own way and obviously very conscious that we still had to keep our social distance spacing so we had a lot to compete with and obviously the time that we were told that this was going to take place we didn't have an awful lot of time so as you can imagine immediately to it and it was rehearsal after rehearsal until it was absolutely perfect it couldn't have gone any better than the day itself it was a beautiful day wasn't it it was abs- the weather was stunning yeah absolutely gorgeous and um you know the conditions were perfect the troop and the color itself was absolute perfection i think that the highlight for myself was standing approximately 15 meters away from her majesty as soldiers we always present arms to her majesty or any royal dignitaries. It's the highest compliment that you can pay whilst holding a weapon system. And for a split second, me and Her Majesty, we made eye contact, and I've never ever felt anything quite like it ever before. The sweat was dripping down my back to the point I could feel it dripping down the backs of my legs. My chin was raised, my shoulders were pinned back. We looked at each other, we made that eye contact. And my whole life, flashed before my very eyes because I thought you've done all right for yourself Reese. you've come from being the lowest you could possibly imagine to now stood 15 meters away from her majesty and what I did actually think about is if only she knew how hard I had fought to be stood in front of her and not only that not many people can say that they've served for her majesty inside and outside Who knows, maybe one day I'll get that medal for serving inside and outside. Now, you recently left the army to concentrate on your organisation, Defeat, Don't Repeat. So it must be hard to leave the army. Um, Certainly, you know, when I left the police, uh, your identity is kind of tied up with that institution. And I'm guessing perhaps you had some similar feelings of wondering, well, who who am I now? It was a very difficult sort of position to find myself in now. Partially one of the reasons to uh, making that decision was like any job, career, you get to a point where you feel like you're just going through the motions. It's a shelf life, isn't it? So I'd reached a point in my career where I felt like I'd become sort of quite complacent. I wasn't getting the job satisfaction that I used to have. It's a funny environment because everybody is pretty much in the same boat. You're around people that that whinge and moan and say, you know, I've had enough of this job. And and what I was finding was I was becoming one of those people. Well, in the police, they usually drive the van on the shift. (laughs) (laughs) They stuck the oxygen out the room. Yeah. And I thought, you know, life's too short and there's only me that can make that change or make that difference. And after, you know, having a, a long, hard think about it, I decided, right, now's the time. I didn't really have a plan in place. I just knew that... I'd, you know, reached my, um, my, my sort of, my peak, and I thought, right, let's let's move on. Defeat, don't repeat. 
It's a great tagline. How did that come about? Back in 2018, going on to 2019, I was deployed for my second tour in Afghanistan. We had some downtime. Um, what's very interesting is the room or the accommodation I was actually in was identical to a cell that I'd previously spent time in. I just imagine that could have been quite triggering for you. It didn't really dawn on me until I had that downtime, that respite, and I was laying there, and they, and they were they were bunk beds, funny enough, ironically, exactly the same. The room was probably about the same size. So I had my music on, and uh, the first thing I did was reach for my notepad. I grabbed that notepad, and I wrote the words, help. What stemmed from that was, I was thinking then, I wonder if so-and-so has sorted his life out. I wonder if so-and-so is still in prison or if he's got himself sorted. You know, people that I used to affiliate and associate with. And I, and I was just wondering, had they broke the cycle like I had? And I sat there and I thought, again, you've actually come a long way. You've done this all on your own. Now, I'm in a position where I can make a difference to people's lives. I want people to experience what I've experienced and what greater person to be able to do that than myself. So pen to paper, put a plan in place, and I decided, right, this is where Defeat Don't Repeat comes into it. Once I'd returned back to the UK, I put the proposition forward to my sort of hierarchy and it explained, this is what I would like to do to help people have a slice of the action, break that cycle, live an honest life and, a, and a, a proper life well they say don't they it's one of the five pathways to well-being nhs is to, is to help others that altruistic view of, of not looking inwards but but giving outwards so just tell me what some of the things that you've been doing with the organization again it was something that i never envisaged growing arms and legs very quickly once it became sort of made out into the public domain People absolutely loved it. They were so supportive and are still very supportive of it. And what I decided to do was put my story together via a presentation. And the, the main key to take away from that presentation is, again, it doesn't matter how rock bottom you reach in life or you think that's it, you've given up on life. You are always given a second opportunity to make that change. But... You've got to want to change yourself. Nobody can do it for you. You've got to understand it's down to you as an individual. People can offer you all the tools and all the assistance in the world, but if you're not prepared to make that change, then you're not going to change. So the presentation is very powerful. I've been to lots of prisons throughout the UK delivering this presentation. Uh, schools, uh, universities, colleges, We've done a broadcast on the um, BBC as well. Been in the Telegraph, the Times, the Soldier magazine. It really has been pushed out there in the public eye, and it, and it's and it has nothing but positivity. Military establishments, cadets, pretty much any organisation, top organisation you can think of, it has been exposed and it has been delivered as well, um, especially to the uh, probation services. Um, Surrey and Hampshire Police as well are very supportive of what I'm setting out to achieve. And I know you're very keen to get into school, aren't you? Yes. This is absolutely vital that this presentation is heard within schools all across the UK. It needs to be compulsory. It needs to be a mandatory presentation. And why, you may ask, and I'll explain why. Because youngsters are at secondary schools are at their most vulnerable at that moment in time social media has a massive part to play in it you are trying to discover yourself as an individual as i've already referred to unfortunately you can find yourself going down the wrong path grooming and exploitation from dealers and organizations will purposely target secondary schools knowing they're an easy target and easy to win so if my presentation can also show truly what a lifestyle of crime actually involves and the misery and the upset it causes and what to look out for and what to avoid. I sense you're quite philosophical about your experiences, Rhys. So looking to the future, what does that hold for you? I want to continue with Defeat Don't Repeat. I want to continue to expose what that lifestyle of crime actually involves, what misery it causes, what upset it causes and how you can stay clear 
of even of even contemplating stepping foot into that lifestyle. It comes with hell of a lot of um, negativity, you know, and um, the more that we can express what that lifestyle leads to will act as a deterrent for anyone even contemplating. But not only that, I think it's really important that the parents are educated on what to look out for within their own children and who to seek help from and what you can do as parents to help prevent your your children falling into that cycle. So finally, Reese, the old you, people will be listening to this saying uh, a leopard never changes his spots. Um, it's quite a stereotypical view, isn't it? Uh, I would suggest that you were never actually a leopard in the first place. There it is. You, you have the old you. Are you ever visited by that person? That person, my previous lifestyle, will always be there. I would be lying if I was to say to you, do I ever think about it? Of course I do. I think about it daily. And that's what helps keep me on the straight and narrow because I look back and think what situation and what person I used to be. That is enough of a, of a motivation to ensure that I never slip or fall back into that lifestyle again. I'm often asked, would you change your past given an opportunity? My answer to that is no. Because if I had not done everything that I had done in my previous lifestyle, I wouldn't be or become the person that I am today. I'm a firm believer that life is completely mapped out for you. I was supposed to go down that path. And the fallout from that is I'm now in a position to help so many others as well who are unfortunately on that path. I want to be the voice. I need to be seen. I need to be heard to tell and reach out to these people to say it's not the end. And, you know, I'm forever grateful that I've come this far. And again, I, I most certainly would never change my past. No, absolutely not. Reese Rutledge, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.